The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Tell Life Limited, ABN 7005 0109 450, AFSL 2378 48, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. My name is Sasha Lutkovsky and I'm a former insurance advisor of 15 years and CEO of The Sale Agency, a firm dedicated to helping advisors grow their businesses. This series is all about insurance, exploring the start to end process of putting a policy in place all the way through to claim time. I'm joined by five experts who share their knowledge and insights and a few stories along the way. So let's get started. This podcast series is brought to you by leading Australian life insurer, TAL. TAL is committed to partnering with advisors to protect the financial well-being of their clients, now and into the future. TAL's accelerated protection products ensure your clients have access to cover options that are suited to their individual needs. Last financial year, TAL paid $3.5 billion in claims to over 45,000 customers. Persons deciding whether to acquire or continue to hold life insurance issued by TAL should consider the relevant product disclosure statement. The target market determination for the product is also available online at tal.com.au. Welcome to episode two in our series on all things insurance. I am joined by Hayden White, insurance and investment advisor at Pool and Partners Investment Services to chat about a very relevant topic given the cost of living pressures, increasing insurance premiums, and demonstrating the value of what you do for your clients, which is how you can ensure a client's insurance policy remains in force. Hayden, welcome. Thank you. So, Hayden, I always like to start off by getting to know our guests. So, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into financial advice? Uh, Yeah, so I came into the financial services industry in 2001, um, just after I finished high school in 2000. And basically started from the ground up. So, started in administration, um, worked my way up to power planning, um, then eventually went into advising. Um, I was always very interested in stock market and economics in in high school. Um, So, I, I looked at sort of going down that track initially, but after my auntie was actually diagnosed with um, cancer um, and had some pretty bad uh, financial stress simply by not having really the right insurance in place, I really uh, fell in love with the need um, and the importance of personal insurance protection. Um, And so for the next probably uh, nearly a decade, I went off and and specialised in that area, but always had the um, the background in, in the economics and the investment markets. So over the last nearly, well, basically two decades now that I've been in the industry, I've sort of moulded into what you would refer as to that holistic advisor that looks after both personal insurance um, and investment and, and superannuation work. So, uh, yeah, I've been advising now for, for nearly probably 15 years. It's interesting how, you know, so many of us, myself included, sort of came out of school, um, you know, started quote unquote at the bottom. Uh, yep. Worked our way up through admin, para planning, and then you know went into um, advising. It's 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 not an uncommon journey, um, and interesting also that it was a, it was almost a particular life event that that helped you focus on insurance for the first part of your of your career. So it's interesting to me that you started off in insurance and then moved into other sorts of uh, financial advice as well. So. A lot of our listeners are either insurance only and you know wanting to get into holistic advice or holistic advisors who want to do more insurance. So how do you balance your time between insurance, which is such a massive exercise on its own, and also the holistic advice, investment advice and all that? How do you balance your time between the both of them? Yeah, it, it's, um, it can be tricky and we have gotten, to, well, me particularly with my personal side of things have gotten to a point where I, I nearly am basically capped as far as new business that I can take on. And that's why we have brought some some younger advisors into, into the practice. One is actually an ex-accountant. Um, so he's obviously already got a financial background. <clears throat> the other is 
a junior advisor that we're training up the way that we want him to be trained up in our business. Um, so we've got some support there to take on the new business side of things. For me personally, um, what I do with the investment work is very different to what I do with the insurance work. So two very different systems, two very different service, I suppose, agreements that we have with with clients. Um, it is very admin heavy, especially on the insurance side of things. And anyone that's been in the game for long enough and has a reasonable client base knows that what comes with insurance eventually is also claims. Um, and how do you also manage that ongoing claims process in addition with the everyday admin work? One of our things has been going after very good administration staff. Um, now, I've been lucky in that I've had a, a fantastic PA with me for, for 10 years. Um, we've also had a number of other administration staff that have been with us for uh, five years plus. Um, so we do have, for every one advisor, we've got basically two and a half to nearly three admin staff. Um, some of them are full-time, some of them are part-time. Um, but we want to keep a very high service level, um, especially when you're dealing with things with insurance, because as your book grows, even simple things like change of bank account details, change of address details, um, policy alterations, updating superannuation details, all those sorts of things do take a big um, time consuming role in the practice. And as an advisor, you don't want to be doing those things. Your your job is to be dealing with the client, not to be doing, doing those day in day out admin jobs. So having a robust um, process in place is very critical. Um, the process needs to be near perfect if you're going to run a very efficient business from a large scale point of view. And also, I think the second um, key point is actually dealing with insurers where themselves have a, a very good administration um, side of business behind the scenes. There are a number of insurers, I'm not going to name anyone, but there are a number of insurers that do administration well and some that don't do it well. Um, and we know that um, today, key of efficiency and speed of being able to change things is very critical in our business. So we've been very conscious to make commercial decisions in the past to really partner with certain insurers that obviously not just have a great product and a great service offering for our clients, but also how easy is it to change simple things with that insurer? How easy is it to change a simple decline on a CPI, a change of a bank account, a change of address? Can all that be done instantly online or, or via an email? Or are we dealing with an insurer where we've got to fill out another piece of paper every time some, something like that minor does occur? So as your business grows and that admin burden becomes more and more and more, it is very important, for what I believe, is to probably have those three main things. One is a very robust process, um, a very good administration team behind the advisor, um, and thirdly, um, dealing with insurers that you can make changes very quickly. Um, so I think dealing with certain insurers can make a big difference. Um, and as you go through your journey as an advisor, you also work out having relationships with advisors and, and key stakeholders does still help with things like claims management. Um, you know, the insurance industry is very different to the investment in the superannuation industry because it still is very much a relationship business. Um, I think the role that BDMs and support staff with insurance companies do play a, a more significant role than it does with investment and superannuation work, um, simply from the force that once you put an application in force with, say, a superannuation or, or investment, there's nothing really else to do behind the scenes there. It's, it's up to the advisor. Um, whereas with insurance, you've got a whole range of things that can come off the back of that application. There's underwriting, there's admin, there's claims, there's renewals, there's a whole range of things. So yeah, key of process, key of good admin staff and key of dealing with efficient insurers. I really like that point you made about dealing with efficient insurers. And of course, that changes all the time. Businesses go through cycles. So you as a business owner or as an advice professional need to constantly be on top of those relationships. But it's really interesting to me that you have made commercial decisions to uh, have relationships at a particular point in time with particular insurers. You know, many of us, you know, have worked or work with, you know, these open APLs, approved product lists. And so you can more or less, given your dealer group or your license, work with any insurers. But 
I, I, I think it's so key that, you know, of a panel of 10 insurers, you might only at this time work with with five unless there's a case outside of that because it's just such a, a, a more efficient, seamless, scalable type process. And, you know, you've summarized it excellently with the robust process and having a good admin team. And when we talk about keeping a client's policy in force, process in in my experience when I ran my business had so much to do with it, especially from a scalable point of view. You mentioned that in in some ways you you might have hit your sort of current capacity as, as an individual, but I'm sure that that can be better managed or grow with things like processes. So without giving away all your secrets, what sort of processes do you have in your business to make sure that a client's policy can remain in force? Yeah, so one of our, I suppose, key processes is especially when we come up to that anniversary time that we are um, very proactive in getting in contact with the client um, normally four weeks out from the anniversary date. Um, Sometimes that will be earlier. We know that of recent times insurers have been sending out anniversary details sometimes up to two months in advance when there are those big increases coming. Um, But a lot of the times it will be around about that month um, we obviously have a, a, a register that we use through, um, we use Advisor Logic for our, our CRM and off the back of that run um, a, additional spreadsheets with our anniversaries. Um, and so each, it, you know, it can be a bit of a mundane process, but we basically have an, a, a business a process where the administration team will obviously gather the new premium data. We then have our junior advisor that will go into that and look at some of the review Quotes, we then that then comes back to me as the advisor to get in contact with that client. Um, we a lot of our existing clients have come off the back of previous referrals from accountants, um, and those have been really good from a sticking point of view because we still have kept those relationship with the accountants. What that's also allowed us to do is behind the scenes is actually um, review with the client things like what's been their taxable income for the last twelve months. Where do they sit with assets and liabilities on a, on a balance sheet of their business? So we're actually doing a lot of the behind the scenes work from a review point of view that the client sometimes might not be aware of, but we're actually making that a really efficient process for the client. So by the time that that review comes around three to four weeks out from the anniversary, we're being proactive in that we're reviewing, first of all, the policy against the market. Is there any significant savings that we could possibly look at? Um, and it does normally have to be reasonably significant to, to move a policy, um, especially these days because underwriting is a hell of a lot more stricter than what it used to be. Um, and then off the back of that, it is, can we make any alterations that are going to benefit the client? And a lot of the times we're putting ourselves in the client's position. Um, we know that the cost of living pressures has increased quite significantly. And unfortunately, it's not uncommon these days to see increases anywhere from 25, 35, I've seen some increases of 70% on some legacy contracts. So therefore, being proactive is a key part of our process. And again, I come back to having that rigid um, administration team and process in place. Everyone knows their role in the business. We do do a lot of reviews in our business every year. Um, It doesn't matter whether a client's paying $100 a month or $1,000 a month, every client is getting the same service from an insurance point of view. Um, And that just comes back to making sure every policy does stay in force. So we're not neglecting the smaller ones. Um, We believe that everyone, you know, that that is an important element in, in a person's protection portfolio for everyone. So having been proactive and getting in contact with the client well and truly in advance of that premium increase or anniversary date, And then it comes back to educating the client on, again, reinforcing the importance of what is the policy that they've got, what are those policy features, and why should they still have that in force? Um, We know that probably post year one of implementation of an insurance policy, um, clients generally forget what they're covered for, how much they're covered for, and what policy that they've got. You know, you would probably remember when, when you're an advisor and you know, you, you talk to a client and they you got TPD cover, for example, and they would say, oh, if I get cancer, I get paid on that. Done. It's like, well, not particularly. You have to get to an element of the definition. That's more your trauma side of things. So 
again, coming back to making clients understand the importance of why they're keeping these policies in force and then trying to come up with a practical solution as to if there has been a significant increase, what elements can we possibly alter within that protection portfolio that's going to still make sure the client does have enough cover but is practically affordable going forward. Um, so there are obviously steps in that process, but again, it's it's for, for our business, I believe it's getting in contact with the client well and truly out from that anniversary date so that we don't, you know, it's not a surprise one week out and then having discussions well and truly out from the anniversary date, what possible changes could be made. Um, the, a process in regards to making sure that policies don't lapse, again, um, we have a very good administration team that anytime we, we get a notification that there's been a missed premium, the admin team, the requirement is that they get onto that within 24 hours. Um, so that will be normally a direct phone call to the client. And a lot of the times it's actually just the fact that clients have changed debit details or a credit card, or there might be a different USI number for a superannuation that where a rollover hasn't come about. So those sort of elements, it's, it's about getting onto the client ASAP, but having that that admin team and that process and making the, the admin team actually aware that how important this is, that if a policy does lapse, there's a big implication not only for us, but for the client. I am, I'm a massive fan of processes and, you know, I think to run any business of any size, whether it's a, a you know, a single advisor or, you know, a business with multiple advisors, that processes are absolutely key. And I know inherently, I think we all know that as business owners or, or you know, advisors. But one of my questions that I, that I often like to ask people is, is the process up here in your head or is it, it you know, programmed? Is it that, you know, in your business, for example, do you have a step-by-step sort of flow chart with, um, templates that that therefore the client experience is always the same and clients always get that? Or again, is it just this is what we do and everyone knows that's what we do? Where are you at with your processes? Yeah, no, our, our process is definitely documented. Um, I mean, as I said, I've, we've, we've been lucky that we have a number of admin staff that have been with this for five plus years. But anytime anyone new comes into the practice, and I'll give our junior advisor probably a good example because he, he came on board with us about six months ago. Um, even though his progression is essentially to be an advisor, for the first six months, all he's doing is is administration and learning the, and learning the process and going through that procedural process of what we do. Um, because his journey, and I suppose like a lot of people when they start off, is that you do have time to to see a client and also do your own processing. Um, and then eventually you'll get to a stage where obviously you've got a scalable business and you'll employ someone else to do those duties. Um, but in our business, we definitely have a documented process. We do have those flow charts through our CRM and also through um, our um, our spreadsheet that's basically on the, on the cloud that everyone can access within the office. So at any one point, people can go into that register and see who's worked on it, who's done um, the actual um, data of, of the updated um, anniversary details, who's done the the comparison quotes, and then who's actually been in contact with the client. So that that I suppose you would call it a flow chart, but it's just based off a of a simple um, spreadsheet. But the whole office can can go in there, and any time it's been touched, it it shows who's actually dealt with that file. Uh, I just, I can't extol the virtues of a documented process map, whether it's an Excel spreadsheet or a Word doc or whether you use a program like ProMap, something like that. I just can't extol the virtues of it enough. It makes business so much more scalable. The clients get a consistent experience. Clients, yep. in in my experience, want consistency. I think that sometimes we can get a little bit worried that, oh, if it's a if it's the same experience all the time, people will think that we kind of don't know what we're doing. I I just, I just It's just so important. And also, from a compliance point of view, having a documented process that ticks the boxes um, and then some because then you can engineer whatever you want in your process for a great client experience. I just love a good process map. I think it's, yeah, I think it's absolutely important. Yeah, like and, I say, and I think these days we know that um, profitability of insurance businesses is not what it used to be. And so again, not just from a compliance um, point of view and, and a, a, I suppose a flowing of seamless administration and process, but 
if you're trying to look for that scalable business, your process um, and your systems behind the scene need to be near, near perfect. Um, otherwise, it just becomes too much of an administration burden and a burn of time within that practice to be able to get things over the line. Um, if you don't have those right processes in force and you don't have those flow charts or a CRM behind the scenes that's doing a lot of the, the helping and a lot of the mapping for you, then it just becomes um, a bit of a dog's breakfast and all that ends up having is that client that you, you know, trying to make some some time and, and money on and get policies over the line or get amendments done just simply does not become profitable. So that is another key part of the process, especially these days, as we know that um, there's more red tape, there's more time involved. So those things need to be very, very important to deal with. Yeah. And I think also then having these sort of processes in place, I, I think it does set businesses apart. Um, yep. It doesn't have to be the most exciting process. It just has to be consistent, predictable, and deliver on on the client's expectations ultimately. And of course, you know, business efficiencies and scalability and profitability. So that for me is one way, possibly one quote unquote invisible way that we can demonstrate as advisors value to clients, our value as advisors and also value potentially of the insurance policy. So in your business and with your clients, how do you demonstrate, let's start off with the value of the insurance policy, because we're talking all about how to retain clients, how to keep clients policy in force. So how do you demonstrate the value of the policy of the insurance to your clients, first of all? First of all? Yeah, I suppose from our side of things, I, look, I've never been a big salesperson, to be honest. So for me, it's always been about educating the client in regards to what what policy are they taking out? What does that entail? And how would that financially benefit them in in a life-changing situation? So the first point is uh, a lot of clients will come to us and a lot of the times they will have existing cover, especially even if it's just default cover through superannuation. It's then an education process and making the clients understand what they've got, what they're lacking, um, what the risks are that of them not taking out a particular policy. Following on from that, one of the things that we do, which is just a simple thing, is actually every time that we do an annual review for a client and provide an anniversary report, is actually also attach our claim statistics. Um, And we do get a lot of feedback on that. And now we've got claim statistics going back to 2010. Um, So we do have, you know, 13 years worth of data now. Um, that is one simple way, especially if you've got a, an established practice where you have had claims, where you can simply put that, and it's just being openly and honest with the client. Some years we have a lot of claims, sometimes we don't. Um, and that's just the reality of insurance. You know, in one year you might have 100 claims, in the next year you might have 10. Um, but it's making the clients understand that claims do happen. Um, and clients generally will forget, again, I come back to, you know, post year one, what am I covered for? What's this policy? What am I paying for? Well, you're paying for these these types of situations when claims do come about. So we provide very transparent data to clients. Um, we also have in the past provided um, claim stories. Um, and any time that we do a um, process an insurance claim for a client, we get them to provide some feedback that we can communicate out um, to our existing clients on our website, through social media, those sorts of things. I think also in regards to trying to um, instill the importance of a risk portfolio for a client and continuing on, you know, essentially for their working life as they do need it, um, is if you're also in a position where you're looking after other elements of their financial needs, be it superannuation, investment work, um, maybe there might be some um, cash flow or, or external sort of advice that you're giving outside the insurance side of things, um, is that most of our clients are also on our on, on our regular, regular newsletter, which we send out sort of on a, on a fortnightly to three-week basis. Um, and that has a lot of different things. It's more of a holistic um, communication. Um, a lot of it does evolve around investments and markets and superannuation, but we do also provide updates in regards with insurance changes and and legislation changes, those sorts of things. Now, again, whether every client reads it or not, I know that every client doesn't read it, but it's about that ongoing communication to clients and keeping them engaged with you. 
I think if you're simply just sending out a letter once a year um, and and hoping for the best, your your drop off rate is probably going to be a lot higher than than an advisor that's in more regular communication with with that client. Um, and as I said, be it whether you're educating them through claims that you've had in your office, claim stories, or be it through other services that you can offer that might value the client, whether it's insurance or not, it's about keeping them engaged. So when you do come that to that annual review, it's not a, oh, who are you again? It's a, oh, yes, this is part of our ongoing process and we understand that this is just part of our overall portfolio for our financial services needs. It's kind of like, you know... <sighs> The term marketing, right? Ultimately, that's kind of what this is, but it is really the ongoing education piece, which you know is what we've been talking about. And I think that when we think about specifically insurance, insurance relationships tend to be very heavy on at the beginning, then you know once a year, ideally with that renewal process, and then very heavy on a claims time. But how you know as sort of we've just covered, this is what you do to to you know have that relationship with your client in the boring middle, right? Yes. Keep front yep. of mind, keep demonstrating your value. And it it is the things like the newsletters. And this is not this is not a marketing <laughs> the focus of this is not marketing, but it is, you know, stay in front of mind with clients, but also adding value. Just sending a a newsletter with just generic stories is not necessarily adding value to your clients. It is having those claim stats that are very relevant to your business. It's having stories that are relevant to them. It's having um, you know, the policy and product updates. It's all those sorts of things. And it's also about reaching people across multiple mediums, which is kind of, you know, what you, you've said. You've got the newsletters, the social media platforms. Do you do things like videos in your business? Do you get video testimonials from clients and claim and those sorts of things? We, we have done in the past. Um, to be honest, we've, we haven't done one in probably a couple of years, but we have done some in the past in regards with uh, video updates. We've done some claim testimonials in the past with with video updates as well. Um, that is something that we we are looking to to revamp, especially as we've got some other advisors that have come on in recent times. Um, and we did actually get into the habit of one time of actually doing, a, especially with our investment um, reports, of doing uh, sort of a quarterly update via via video. Um, like like most good things, you tend to go away from them for some reason. Um, and those are the sorts of things we're sort of trying to implement back into the business because I think you're definitely right that that video element, um, even though it might be a bit more generic that can go out to everyone, that's just an efficiency of sort of process because you are connecting with a lot more people. But off the back of that, you can then come back and, and individually and tailor the client situation for what they need. Um, if I look at our practice, you know, I, I started off as a risk only advisor. And, you know, for that first sort of um, decade, that, that's all I did. And I think for, for young people coming into the industry, that to me, that makes more sense. I think if you're, if you're, a, if you're a young 20-something-year-old that's trying to go out and, and give advice to, to retirees with superannuation and investment, um, you're probably going to be a bit behind the, the eight ball there with, with up against uh, advisors that have got more experience and, and have been in the game for a bit longer. So... My, my, I suppose, growth in my business, um, when I look at the holistic side of things and looking after clients' investments and superannuation, um, a lot of that has actually come from insurance clients. So mm -hmm. because we've done a good job for them in the past, at, at points in time, they've gone, hey, I've, you know, I've seen on your newsletter you do this, or by the way, can you have a look at my superannuation, et cetera, et cetera. So then all of a sudden, they not just become an insurance client, but they've transitioned from being you know, a young person that needs insurance needs to all of a sudden, um, they're, they're earning reasonable money, they've got super contributions going in. So when then looking after their, their superannuation needs and, and the investment work around that. So I think there there is a great opportunity there, especially for younger people that if they're getting, instead of heading directly off into the investment side of things is to potentially go off in the other way and head off onto the risk side of things. We know that there is a, a, a huge gap there in the market we know that a lot of a lot of older advisors that have been in the game have have now exited from the insurance side of things. Um, that creates a real opportunity for for newer people and especially younger people coming coming into the industry. And and for me, that's that's what started off. And then you basically can become that holistic advisor um, down the line to provide those additional services. But 
Yeah, I think that I think the key is the education and keeping clients engaged is a really important factor in, in how we've been able to grow our business. And as I said, even even as an insurance client, you know, every client needs to know about end of year superannuation strategies. Um, whether they're an insu- whether they're an insurance client only or whether they're a holistic client, you know, providing that communication is those little one percent add values that. If, if another advisor came up to them or, you know, in the old days, they would go to the bank and, and the bank would try to poach them um, with their insurance products, they're probably more likely to stay with you because you've got those other elements that is not just insurance. So I think those key points are very critical in making sure clients are a lot more sticky for your business and, and a lot more long-term client as well. Absolutely. And I just, you know, I I might be a little bit biased because I was a risk only advisor for 15 years, but I I just, there's such, as you you yourself said, there is such an opportunity in insurance still. As you said, a lot of advisors, risk only advisors have left, are leaving the market. There is a massive gap there, but there's opportunity for all different types of advisors. So if you're a younger advisor coming into the profession, insurance is an excellent place to start. If you want a crash course in financial advice, start in insurance. You will get to know people. You will get to know product. You will get to know everything about the process. If you're an existing risk advisor who is you know, retaining risk and only wants to do that, People are leaving in droves. There are There is so much opportunity for you there. If you're a holistic advisor who wants to do more risk, there's so much opportunity there too. And I think that risk is a lot of work. Insurance is a lot of work in a, in a range of areas. It's people work and it's, it's admin work, as we've highlighted. And it sounds very simple and I'm making it sound very simple, but if you invest the time in scalable processes, risk can still be very profitable and also be a great experience for you, your team, and your clients. Um, but I think where it can fall down for advisors of all types is the processes and the systems in place to make sure that it is a good experience for everyone. That's sort of how I've how I've seen it play out for 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 other advice practices. Yeah, and I definitely think that um, if advisors are coming into the industry and they do have potentially more of a, an investment or a superannuation background. That can actually be a real big advantage in regards to the risk side of things because it does provide a lot of knowledge in regards to policy structure and policy ownership, what you can and can't do through superannuation. Um, If you've got a superannuation or investment background, you've probably got um, some knowledge around self-managed super super funds, um, um, trustee requirements, all those sorts of things. So, you know... If we look back and go back years and years ago when we had some of those, you know, I remember going to a lot of PD days and a lot of the the old riskies, you know, a lot of them wouldn't keep up to speed with um, legislation changes, um, structuring changes, even product changes. If you can be all over product um, and the way that that can benefit one client compared to a different one, when you come across those policies, all of a sudden you've got a an advantage on top of that other advisor, then um, having that extra knowledge and having that financial background behind you can actually be a real big benefit to going into the risk side of things if you're not already there. So um, as you said, there is a ma- massive gap and there will just be more and more of a gap. We know that advisor numbers aren't really increasing at this point in time, unfortunately. And so there is a, a massive gap there. We know that the banks have gotten rid of all their advisors. There are a lot of clients out there walking around with no advisor at this point in time. Um, and I, if I go back and look at my own experience, the first firm I ever w- worked in was self-funded retirees. Now, they don't need insurance. Um, it was a boutique firm that specialised in self-managed super funds, self-funded retirees. Um, there was a lot of recontribution strategy work. There was a lot of technical work around about pensions and, and income streams and that sort of thing. Nothing to do with insurance, but it gave me a really good background of understanding the technical side of things of superannuation, the, the superannuation system, um, and how that, that can then work from an insurance point of view. So uh, again, I think that if you've got potentially that technical background, it can really add value if you're doing the risk side of things. Yeah. And look, I think you're exactly right. And I think that, you know, you can't be an advisor and not have a technical background, right? Like even when I was a holistic, uh, sorry, when I was a risk only advisor, you know, the amount of information and knowledge that I had around tax, super, all those sorts of things, it goes both ways. So the holistic yeah. advisors already have that knowledge too. It's just making that jump into 
oh, I need to know about medical stuff and oh, filling out insurance applications. But it's not it's not necessarily a knowledge gap leak. No. Uh, I, I think in a lot of ways, we uh, both types of advisors, risk only and holistic, both have quite a foot in each other's camps. Yeah, uh, from, I, from I think coming back to your point, I think it's definitely just more of a process. I think mm. I think a lot of uh, advisors get overwhelmed with the process of a filling out a lengthy application. And if we again, I go back to what I initially said, where you look at the process of say investment and in superannuation work. Once the client's happy to go ahead, you lodge the the, the the superannuation work and it's done, right? Whereas with insurance, you, you've you gotten the, the sale over the line, but then you have to do the application, get through underwriting, put the policy in force, inform the client. That all comes about with process. Yeah. Um, and it also comes about, obviously, with um, having the knowledge of what questions to ask if a client does disclose medical information, what additional questions do you ask off the back of that? Now, um, I know with yourself and I back in the good old days, um, okay. there was actually a lot of there was actually a lot of training that insurance companies actually did. I mean, um, I remember with with a number of companies, you actually had to sit a test to be able to provide um, the product advice, um, and that would be. Uh, you know, a number of maybe a half day going through their actual product in depth. Um, I think that um, in those new advisors or advisors who aren't astute to to doing a lot of risk is simply to lean on the, the business development manager. And that simply might be a case of getting them to come in for one day a week over, over a month or something like that and even get your administration team involved, which is what we've always done. Um, you know, getting them involved so everyone knows the process. It's not just one person in the office. And that's what we sort of pride ourselves on is that I know what process involved. I, I have, you know, I've sort of let go of obviously the ins and outs and the day to day. I, I don't know which form to lodge where, but I know the process. Um, but I think everyone that is involved in that risk side of things, be it the advisor, the admin, the junior advisor, needs to know what that step by step process is. Um, and if you don't have someone that you can lean on that's got that experience, simply going to a, you know, a, a number of insurance companies and, and getting some of that support in regards to underwriting and questions to ask and how do you lodge the application, all those sorts of things. Once you know that, the daunting task of lodging insurance is then gone. Um, and I think that's the big hurdle, especially for investment advisors or newer people coming in is going, oh my God, this is scary. I have to ask these people about really in-depth health questions. But at the end of the day, it's just about being professional, being open and honest, making the clients understand you're under the Privacy Act, you're not detailing anything anywhere else. This is going straight to the insurance company. So having that process and leaning on the on different insurers for that support is key because you know what, 10, 15 years ago, they used to they used to do that day in, day out. That was just part of um, part of coming in the industry, and obviously, a lot of that um, has gone, unfortunately. Yeah, and I think there are a lot of resources available to new advisors, existing advisors of all different types across these these questions, these areas that we might need a bit of adv- advice ourselves in. Uh, what do I do when? So we've we've had some really really great discussion around you know how process is key and and consistency is key and all that sort of client experience. So one thing that I want to come back to with client experience when we're talking about how we can make sure our client's insurance policy remains in force is having those difficult conversations. You and I and all of our listeners know that cost of living is increasing, pressure is increasing, legacy products are premiums are increasing, premiums are increasing on everyday products. How, how do you have those difficult conversations with clients? Because there's going to be at least one at renewal time who's very unhappy with their premium increase. So yeah. how do you have those difficult conversations? Um, yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, no one wants to pay more for insurance. Um, and a lot of the times, even when people come to see you, one of the goals is obviously to reduce the cost of their insurance, right? Um, but yeah, we are at a critical point in the insurance industry world Um not just for new policies, but more particularly probably legacy contracts. And even if new advisors are coming in, into the industry, you might be taking over those legacy contracts as the servicing advisor. And as I said before, it's not uncommon to see 
25, 35% increases, especially around income protection and disability cover. Um, what we do with our clients is being open and honest in regards to why those increases has come about. Um, a lot of the times people might be confused and go, well, it's the advisor's fault that their premium's gone up, right? And it's like, <laughs> no, it's not our fault. Um, but I think it's about, and again, I come back to harping on to this word about education, but for us, when we provide this annual report, if there has been a significant increase, we're educating the client on why that is. And we'll actually, you know, in our, um, not just the body of our email communication, but also on our annual reports, we're actually detailing why premiums have gone up over the last number of years. And this is a combination of, let's take income protection as a perfect example. We know that pretty much every insurer in Australia has not made money on an income protection contract for the last seven, eight consecutive years. Why is that? Mental health claims have, have gone from 8 to 10% to 30%. Capital requirements that APRA requires for insurance companies have, have increased significantly. Um, the, the investment return that they're getting on those capital requirements has decreased. Um, so we know that the profitability from an insurance company point of view um, has decreased quite significantly, probably over the last decade. Um, and so it's relating that client uh, or, or giving that client back that information as to, at the end of the day, there's there's only so many ways that an insurance company can get back in the black. And, and one of them is is increasing premiums. That's the quickest way. Another one is obviously pulling the lever in regards to underwriting. Um, product is another one. How, you know, does that become more restrictive? And we saw that with the legislation change in 2021 with the government on, on income protection. And obviously that came about because of the profitability. Basically, we know that that ASIC and APRA were looking at the industry and says, well, hey, if you guys don't don't change things, we're not going to have an income protection industry in the next five years because it's just not going to work. So if you've got business clients, I think it's very easy to relay to them um, because they are business minded to say, look, at the end of the day, the insurance product is, is a business as well. They need to make money to be able to continue to pay out claims. The reason why these claims of, or the reason why the premium has gone up 25 or 30% is because of these half a dozen reasons and actually educating the client in regards to why that is. And if, if you're a business, if we look at a product and we've got life, TPD, trauma and income protection, and if out of those four or five products, you've got one being life insurance, which is your profitable one, and your TPD is now a break even to a loss, your TPD is a trauma uh, is, a, is a break even to a loss and your income protection is definitely a loss, of course you're going to put up premiums and 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 that would be a similar case in your own business. If you've got four or five elements and only one of those sectors is making money, unfortunately you're going to have to put up premiums across the board. Um, so again, educating the client firstly in regards to why has that premium gone up significantly more than traditionally what their age-based increase should be. Um, secondly, then... Um, making the client understand and go, well, yes, there is an increase. What can we potentially alter that's going to make this practically affordable for you going forward? Now, at the end of the day, it would be great if every client could have $2 million worth of trauma cover. It would be great if we could ensure everyone with all the bells and whistles on an income protection contract. But we know that practically it's not affordable to do that. So we have to come back and look at the client's situation Again, we do a lot of the work behind the scenes before we actually provide the annual report to the client. And again, that's having a great relationship with with accountants and having mutual clients. But you have a client that's in a situation, and especially when we're looking at legacy contracts within car protection, you know, can we potentially look at options where we can make alterations where you've got a 20, 25, 30% increase? Are there options there where we can basically remove that whole increase for this year on a pulse policy alteration so you're still keeping the cover in place but it's just alterating certain elements of your risk portfolio to make it affordable going forward so that you know that that policy is now got not going to lapse it's going to stay in force and that could be simple things like waiting period alterations agreed value to indemnity especially if that indemnity contract is a three-year pre-disability definition um taking out uh, bells and whistles on certain income protection policies um, is the client at an age where they may no longer need the trauma reinstatement option. Um, are, are they in their 50s? The likelihood of them having two trauma events potentially before the age of 60 or 65 would be bloody unlucky. So 
is there those sort of elements where you might be saving 10% here, 15% there. Day three accident options is a great one for manual workers. Are they now at a point in their business where they no longer need that day three accident option? Have they transitioned from the guy that's on the tools to the guy that's running a, a business where they're no longer on the tools? So they can go a 30-day waiting period. So I think it comes back to being open and honest and transparent about why that increase has has happened, making the client understand why why it has increased. It's not you as the advisor that's increasing it. It's it's these elements, not just with this insurer, it's it's across the board. Um, and here's the comparison quotes to to show you that it's not just your policy. I haven't picked the most policy most expensive policy <laughs> in the market. Um, look, here's some comparison quotes. And and it can a lot of the times be evident that there is no major significant saving because every insurer, unfortunately, is in the same boat. And so, again, educating the client and being open and honest to make them understand why these increases have come about. And then off the back of that, it would be a discussion with the client to say, well, you know what, I wouldn't like a 30% increase. So what would I like to do to help reduce that by 20% or 30% to get it back to a more practical level, what we were paying last year? I think, you know, we, we, we you're right. We keep going back to this word education because it's it's relevant and it underpins everything that we do with clients, whether it's advice or sorry, whether it's insurance advice or, or, or investment advice. It isn't just here, client, this is our advice. Bye. You know, it is this ongoing education piece. And I think, you know, off the back of that, it's also giving you the advice, the opportunity to set expectations with your clients early on and just flag and say, hey, this is how our relationship is. This is what you can expect. This is blah, blah, blah. And also, I hate to use this this terminology, but it's training our clients. Yep. It's training clients with the expectations you know, that this is how we operate. This is how the profession operates. This is how insurance companies operate. And I think that you know, if we do that, it can soften the blow. It might not mean that clients don't have any uh, questions about why their insurance policy is increased, but I think setting those expectations with the education and that sort of thing can at least really remove that emotional reactive layer that can often happen when we open up our renewal notice and it's a 40% increase. Say, right, I did see some stuff from Hayden about this. I'm still a bit, oh, what do I do? But I'm just going to pick up the phone and call him and have a discussion about rather than a, you know, I can't afford this. This is ridiculous. Insurers, rah, 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 rah. So I think that all of that is is absolute gold. And I know it sounds simple, and yep. it is. Once you've done it a few times and once the processes are there, I think that it is actually quite simple. But if you, as an advisor or as a business, don't have these processes in place, it can take time to invest to get those processes in place. But it's absolutely invaluable. So yeah, and I think, um, again, if you've got that process in place where you can communicate to clients on a on a large scale for something that affects all of them, um, and I know that um, if we take the, the what's going on in the income protection industry as a perfect example, you know, we communicated to our clients a number of years ago about what changes were occurring from a legislation point of view, why they are changing for these reasons, and again, we, we harped on about profitability. Um, we were already starting to see a number of legacy products have significant increases. And we know that if we, you know, we go back to, um, you know, when you're an advisor, it was quite easy to sort of project. We go back 15, 20 years ago, it was quite easy to project what age, what sort of increase you were likely to get. You know, hey, by the time you hit 50, look, industry standard, you're probably going to cop a 10 to 12% increase there. While you're in your 40s, it might be 7 to 8. You know, while you're in your 20s, it might be 5%. Um, that's all gone out the window because of of the profitability issue from a claims point of view. So it is about getting on the front foot and giving the client that expectation up front to say, look, unfortunately, these increases are coming down the line. Um, we're going to have to have those discussions about, um, you know, do we trim back some cover? We still need the cover, but hey, we we initially started with this with this life policy at you know, $2 million. Do we still need that $2 million? Can we reduce it back to 1.5? Hey, that, that trauma insurance that we started at 200 grand that's gone up with, with CPI, hey, it'd be great to still have it at 250 or 300 grand. But, you know, practically, can we reduce that back? And we know that as the client goes on, hopefully assets increase, liabilities decrease. That's, that's obviously the goal. There comes a point where, you know, 
reduction in cover is is what you should be doing for the client. Um, and and whether that's reduction in cover, whether it's policy alterations, you can make some very key changes, especially to an income protection pol- policy, and make it make a huge impact on premium from a decrease point of view without having to decrease the level of cover. And it's just a few things tweaking here or there, which you know is that real add value to the client, but. Yeah, again, I come back to what you mentioned about getting that process and getting information out to clients on a large scale in an efficient way so that they're prepared for what's what's going to come. So it's it's not a shock to them. Absolutely. Hayden, I could talk to you all day. You're a, you're, <laughs> you're a risk advisor after my own heart. Um, <laughs> but we, we, we probably should wrap up. So look, thank you so, so much. I think this has been a really valuable discussion for all types of advisors, those who are, you know, entrenched in risk, those who are, you know, thinking or considering of getting into it. I think there's a lot of information and, and great tips and ideas that they can take away from here. So Hayden, thank you so much for your time today. If any of our listeners uh, wish to connect with you on LinkedIn, I'm guessing they can find you there. Yes, no problem at all. And, and happy to happy to help out anyone and happy to give back to the industry. Excellent. Thank you so much, Hayden. And thank you, everyone, for listening. I hope you got some value out of today's session. 